Hi, in this video I will show you how I made this scene. I used ZBrush, Substance Designer and of course Cinema 4D. First, let me talk about the general workflow itself. I start with a 3D scanned object. In most cases they have a high poly count and are triangulated. To make a nice texture we need good UVs. They don't need to be perfect, but there should be less distortions and no overlapping areas. I also will make a little idle animation and I want to have the possibility to be not too limited if I want to do a more complex animation with it in future. When creating UVs and for the rigging scanning process, I highly recommend to do this not with the high poly version of the model. I will create a low poly version we can unwrap and rig and use the high resolution mesh for baking all the details it provides onto a low poly version. Let's start. First go to 3dscans.com and find the elbow crab. Download it and the first thing I do is just import a file and have a look what's going on. The mesh seems to be not centered to the pivot, so go to Mesh, Axis and choose Center Axis 2. Then just set XYZ position to 0. Rotate the mesh 90 degrees by holding down Shift. I always take care that the scale value of the model is reasonable. To decide this, just create a default cube and compare the size. Next check the wireframe and we see a lot of triangles. In Object, Project Information, you can see the poly count. It's nearly 1.5 million and 700,000 points. That's not so extremely much, but you won't be happy when doing UV mapping, rigging and animating it. I also deactivate the angle limit since we have an organic form and we don't want to have any kind of funk breaks. Before exporting I will adjust the position of my crab once more and after that freeze the transformation. Then export it as obj file. In the next step I will remesh the model with ZBrush. The idea is to create a nice low poly model with quartz and edge loops that works good for UV layouting. Cinema 4D has its own polygon reduction option, but unfortunately it only remeshes with triangulated result and untriangulation doesn't make a usable result. Having clean quartz and edge loops makes the next working steps much easier and faster and ZBrush does a really good job on this point. Import the rotated mesh and just remember the active point count. Open the subtool palette, duplicate the mesh and rename it. Then open the set remesher and see what's the result with default values. You see, we now decrease the points from 700,000 to 20,000. The polyflow is really fine and totally ok for our purpose, but I think we can increase the poly count a little bit. So undo the step and set the target polygons count to 20. Now we have around 40,000 polys and I think that's ok. When you compare it with the original mesh, you will notice that in some areas we lost some little bit of volume. So go to Project and select Project All. I will not use the UV master here in ZBrush because I want to have a little bit more control, so I export the low poly crab and make the UV mapping in Cinema 4D release 22.
Back in Cinema 4D, import the model and switch to the UV edit layout. Now we need to cut the UVs in pieces, so that the distortion of the UVs is as low as possible. The most important tool here is the Path Selection tool. By holding left and drag, it selects the edges. Use Shift and Ctrl to add or remove selection. You also can use the common commands like loop selection. I turn off the work plane that annoys me a little bit. Find a nice edge loop and select the edges on the bottom. Now go to UV Unwrap. It takes a second and then you see the result on the left side. There seems to be a little problem, because the UV space isn't filled up as it should. In most cases the problem is that you forgot to select an edge. In our case it's not hard to find. You can select edges and loops and UV space as well as in the 3D view and then just repeat UV unwrap. Yes, this looks much better. You can use the packing feature if you are not happy with the layout. You also see the border of the UV island on the mesh screen line. If you want to make them more visible, you can adjust their color in the preferences, scheme colors, texture UV editor colors, UV seam color. It is also important that your UV islands are not overlapping and that there is a little gap between each of them. If you want to select specific UV islands, use the Live Selection tool. Hold Alt and double click. Then you can use the common rotation, move and scale tool for adjustment. But that's enough, export it. I will create the texture with Substance Designer. In many cases you would use the Metal Roughness workflow, but I'm more used in the Specular Glossiness workflow. Just choose what you like more. You can convert the maps in the end if you like. Just set the resolution to 4K and start with a name for the main texture. First of all, drag the low poly version of your crap model into Designer and then into your 3D viewport. Next, check if the viewport settings match the workflow you have chosen. In my case, set physically specular glossiness, right click in the Nodes view and set view outputs in 3D view. Also check that DirectX normal is set to false, since we use OpenGL normal maps for U-Render. It's no problem if you use DirectX normals. The only thing you have to do is to set the Flip Y option in the U-Render material normal channel. Now I'm starting to bake all important maps I will use to create a texture. Set it to 4K and then choose the high definition match of the crab.
Then it's time to add the bakers. Ambient occlusion from mesh means that designer will take the high definition mesh for calculating the map and you get all the nice details. Currently I don't know exactly what kind of nodes I will use, so I will add a second position map as mesh baker, rename it and set the mode to one axis and y. There are some nice nodes that need a grayscale position map in Y and not a RGB default position information. I also choose thickness map, world space direction and world space normals. Checking all bakers if everything is set up correctly. Normal map should be OpenGL. Everything else seems to look fine. Start render and on the right view you see the baked maps. I don't see any problems in the ambient occlusion map. Also curvature looks great. Fantastic. All baked maps are now in the resources folder. I will check some of the maps if everything looks good and start with the ambient occlusion map. Also curvature and thickness looks fine. I really love to use these three maps and blend them together to get some kind of basic main texture. Some don't like to put ambient occlusion information into the diffuse map because this should do the renderer, but I don't care. On the one hand I don't overdo it, on the other hand for me it makes sense that in areas that are occluded the influence of weather influences diffuse values too as well as glossiness. However, you can also skip this step. Next I will define the main stripy patterns and choose the grunge map 5. I blend the two colors together and use the save transform node to adjust the rotation and tiling of the grunge map. I set the colors now to red and green. You can press D to let nodes collapse. Now I want to have a third main color for some spots and that is influenced by some of the maps we have baked. There are a lot of edgeware nodes in substance. For this case I used a metal edgeware node. This node needs ambient occlusion map, curvature, position and world space normal. Add a new uniform color and blend it together with the other colors. Adjust the edgeware node as you like and the color as well. I'm happy with the balance of basic shapes the colors have. We have larger areas of colors, middle sized shapes and smaller ones. Of course you can adjust the edgeware node anytime. For the normal map I prefer to use the normal Sobel node, because this node prevents that the normal map gets too sharp. I want the colored areas be on top, so I have to invert the edgeware output.
Next, I use the histogram range node to set a basic glossiness map as well. I want to have the colored areas more glossy, so I choose the inverted edge ver too. Time to do a second iteration to add details. Always remember, don't rush into adding details until your basic shapes are not done. I want to have some color variation and there are tons of possibilities here in Substance Designer. In this case, I used a 3D Perlin noise node. That's really cool, because it uses the position map to wrap the noise according to the mesh. I blend them together and play around with the values. I make the same procedure for the green values. For the rough bottom layer, I will just use the good old BNV Spots 2 node. Now I added details into the color, I also add some into the glossiness as well. Maybe the normal map can also be more detailed. I also put slight different values into the specular texture. At this stage, you could spend hours of time in tweaking and modeling your textures, but I think that's enough to show you the basic workflow. If you switch to iRay and want to see the result, just check the normal setting to get a proper result. I want to add one more iteration for the textures, some kind of dirt. I could do this in the current node graph, but at some point it's better to split things to have good overview. So I create a new graph that will define some kind of dirt. I don't want to spend too much time with it, so I decide to choose the 3D Perlin noise and use this to drive my normal and glossiness. Feel free to spend more time here to add different kind of dirt shapes, wrinkles, bumps, whatever you like. Now create a third graph. In this we will combine the graph main and dirt graph. Use the Material Blend node. By pressing 1 or 3, you can change the outputs. Now they try to find the matching inputs automatically. Oh, there is a little connection error. That's because the output is set to grayscale and the inputs need a color input. I could change that here with a gradient ramp node or fix it in the original graph. 
Connect the needed baked maps into the edgeware. Uh, we should not use the metal edgeware node here, we already used it in the other graph. The good thing about Substance Designer is that it's no problem to change this kind of things. Just reconnect what you need and you get a completely different appearance. I should finish it now, but just a little test with the leak node. Oh, that really gives a nice dirt distribution in the occluded areas, so I decide to mix it with the dirt node. Yes, I'm happy with the result so far. Just adding some normal information and blend it with the existing one. If you are done, just export your textures. Before we continue our scene, we need to make a little break and this is the very last opportunity we really have to think about what we want to do. What kind of animation should be done? Is it enough to assign some deformers or do we need a rig? In my case, I just want to make an idle animation, but also with deformers, this will take a while until it works. I want to keep some possibilities open for the future, maybe I will do some crawling animation or something like that. So I decide to make a small little basic rig with simple IK legs. It's easy to make, but you need to work structured and clean, and you really have to name all your objects, otherwise I promise you, you will rage quit your scene after a while. You also can try Cinema 4D's character insect preset, but keep in mind that you also have to tweak and adjust a lot of things. Import a low poly version of the crab and add two simple spheres as eyeballs. Then create the first joints for the body. I show you how I did the legs and will skip the rest, because it's just a repetitive workflow. There are also a lot of rigging tutorials out there if you want to dive deeper into this topic. Create and parent joints for the leg and place them on the correct location. When placing the joints with the move command, the orientation of the axis doesn't match the bone direction anymore. To solve this, select all joints and use the joint align tool. Then select the first leg joint and use the create IK chain tool. This automatically creates an IK tag and a null object. If you need complex movement with your IK chain, it is important to add a pole object to have more control. Move the pole object upwards and keep attention to the position of the joints. If everything is alright, rename all your objects and freeze the transformation of your foot control and the pole vector object. By the way, you can set rotation values to zero. Next, go to the Object tab of your control object and find the display mode you like. In the Basic tab, you can adjust the color for it. I recommend to set the position and rotation values of your control objects to zero when in T-Pose. Well, I don't know how the T-Pose for a crab is called. 
Now you have to repeat that for every leg. Because it's an scanned object that is not really symmetrical, the mirror joint option doesn't help. I also create some joints and control objects for the body and head and put just a simple PSR constraint on it. I prefer to put the objects on layers grouped in at least three groups. Joints, control objects and meshes. This is very useful for hiding and locking your elements. Now we need to bind the mesh onto the rig. Select the complete hierarchy of your joints, the mesh and open the bind options. For the most cases, keep your joints value to 2. This means the maximum number of joints that can influence one vertex. You can experiment with the modes. Goal is that we get nice deformations and that we don't have too much of adjusting the weights with painting. After binding, move every leg and look where the problems are and what mode works best. Most important areas at first are the elbows. If they are broken, you need to tweak your bind settings or worst case adjust your joints because they are not located good enough. If you decide to work with the result, select the weight tag and open the weights manager. Here you can select every joint and can see the influence on the mesh. I now want to fix the weights that are not ok. Double click on the weight tag and you switch to the weight tool. I recommend that you mainly work in add mode. I will fix the left shear and select the elbow joint. The color gradient shows me the influence of the weights. The dark areas on the shear tip indicates that another joint influences that mesh area. I want the elbow joint to be the only one for that, so I paint over the darker areas. I'm ready and can prepare the scene for further steps. Before we start, find a nice ground material on substance source. I use the sandstone strata. First I lock and hide my joints. Then I create some new render materials and assign them to the meshes. Start new render in the view panel menu and deactivate the save title frame if you want. Now I assign the crab textures for diffuse, specular, glossiness and normal. To get a better impression how the textures interact with lighting, I set up some light sources. I like to put them into a null that I leave on position 0, so I can position it very easily. I'm setting up basic things in the uRender tag, soft shadows with a very small bias, inverse square falloff and a larger alt angle. Also some color for the light may be an idea. A second light as fill light from above and I'm ready to set up the floor. Setting up scenes is often a work where you switch between materials, 
Lights and Render Settings. For the floor displacement, make sure that displacement is activated in the Render Settings. If you use a simple planar floor, increase the segments a little bit to get a denser geometry for the displacement. I'm not happy with the color of the floor, so I put the texture in a filter shader and increase the live view resolution for shader baking in the render settings. One very important thing to set up is a HDR environment map for specular reflection and image-based lighting. You can download these maps from our homepage. They are in the Lighting Presets library and also as HDR pack downloadable for free. Just play around with the exposure values and the rotation. When using Diffuse IBL, also activate Ambient Occlusion in the Render Settings. OK, one more iteration. I will increase the light intensity a little bit. I forgot to lock the mesh, so I'm doing this now. Before I start animating, I will do one more thing to the materials. I think that a slight amount of subsurface scattering could look good. And I decrease the lightness of the floor once more. Now you could spend dozens of hours in the animation. If it only need to be an idle animation, I use the vibrate tag a lot. Also one for the entire body, but this time I set the rotation values. You also can use our nice IK setup to animate precisely and use uRender to post your things noise-free in real time. I will set up final tweaks now in the render settings. A slight amount of bloom, tone mapping, chromatic aberration, vignette and the filter to bring back contrast and increasing the saturation a little bit. Note that the FXAA is doing a good job when working in real time, because it's very fast. For end quality, I recommend to use the multi-frame sampling instead. Samples 8 means that the entire frame is rendered 8 times, so it has an impact on the performance. But even my old GDX 1060 is good enough to check if this value is enough for my scene and if I have any artifacts or not. If your animation is ready, just set your end resolution and multi-frame sampling and render out your image sequence. 
I hope you enjoyed this workflow tutorial and maybe you got some ideas for your projects. Thanks for watching.